Well, hello. Hope all is well. Thank you for joining us for this online message. Uh, Deep Rivers Church, uh, I hope that your week went well. It was a gorgeous week. I mean, the weather was just fabulous outside. Anyways, uh, so let's jump in. We are uh, kind of closing out a sermon series on the sovereignty of God and how God's sovereignty rules and even uses evil for its purposes, that God has designed the universe to work in such a way that he not just allows evil, but he uh, uses it to accomplish his will, which is really breathtaking if you really think about it. So I want to start off, we're going to be talking about the Tower of Babel uh, this weekend and what um, what good can come from the Tower of Babel. So let me ask you this question. It sounds like uh, the beginning of a joke, but what does the planet Mars have in common with the Tower of Babel? Now, you're going to spend a long time thinking on it. You'll never come up with uh, the right answer. But let me tell you. On December 11th, 1998, uh, NASA launched a $125 million satellite, the Mars Climate Orbiter. And no, so it wasn't a satellite. They sent it off to Mars in September 1999 after 10 months in space. As it approached Mars, it broke apart and burned up in the atmosphere of Mars. And and uh, the folks on Earth, instead of celebrating, they were confused. They had no idea what happened. So in the process of trying to figure out what happened, they realized that the navigation team from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, I think they're in California, they use metric measurements, while the Lockheed Martin people, they're the ones who designed and built the orbiter, use the English system of measurements. Now that seems kind of ludicrous, doesn't it? That very highly intelligent people. Um, one was using metric and one was using English. And maybe your brain is making the connection to the Tower of Babel. Um, the real cause for this orbiter burning up in the Martian atmosphere actually happened thousands of years earlier. And this is the story of Babel, and maybe you'll be able to make the connection if you haven't already. So this is Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. Now the whole world had one language and common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used bricks instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered all over the face of the earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there all over the earth and they stopped building the city. That is why it is called Babel, because the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. You know, when they started speaking different languages, it led to different people groups and different uh, ways of measuring that indirectly led to the metric and English systems of measurement, which indirectly, I think, led to, maybe not so indirectly, led to this orbiter burning up. So, Let's go back to the text. Why, why is this a problem? What is, you know, we're talking about how God is sovereign over sins. What is, what is the sin here? You're, you're looking, I read the passage, Genesis 11, 1 through 9, and, and you're like, I, I, didn't, I didn't get the, what's the sin? What did they do that was so grievous? Well, the problem is you have to look at the context of everything that's going on, and you have to go back two chapters to Genesis Chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9 begins in verse 1. It tells the people, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. 
fill the earth. Three little words that make up a pretty powerful sentence. The people were to fill the earth, and they chose not to. Um, the Tower of Babel not just is a story of rebellion, but it also leads us to some questions. You know, where do past languages and people groups come from? Uh, are they a result of the sin, of a result of sin? I think the answer to that is yes, and here's an explanation. And the answer to the question, is it sin? Yeah, it might be hard for us, but God told them to do one thing and they chose to ignore him. So it also leads us to some questions about the present. Is, are they, is it still a good idea that we have multiples of languages? Is it, is it a good thing or a bad thing? Now there's a headache of translation and currency exchanges, and there's a lot of things that make our lives more complicated because we speak different languages. Missionaries have to dedicate you know, a significant time to language school. Um, but it's a fair question, is it, is it good or bad that there are separate independent political states um, because that also tends to lead to a lot of conflict. And so that's the present, you know, how we wrestle with different languages and people groups now. And then the future, what does, what does God think about us being united? What does God think about a united one world government? And will the world end with one? And, and some of you might have some hints on that. But like I said, the Tower of Babel in the city, um, it actually exposes two sins, not just one. Um, they were told to fill and multiply, but they chose to say, but there's two, there's two. Uh, building the city avoids being dispersed over the whole earth. Again, they were told to disperse, they chose not to. So building a city is the one sin, but the second sin is building a tower to the heavens. And why did they do that? They did that because they want to make us a name for themselves. Now, the city and the tower, actually, if you think about it, they're outward expressions of an inward sin. Uh, God's more concerned about our heart and not just the behavior and not just the act. And, and oftentimes we see people do things and we think, why do they do that? The reason is not always the cause. And... Um, and, and the bottom line is what was going on in their hearts. What was the inward sin? In the, they built the city because they had a love for security. They didn't want to take the risk of filling the whole earth. They were familiar. And, and we have a, certainly a much of security that comes from familiarity. And they wanted to build a tower because they wanted to make a name for themselves. They wanted the, the praise, the love of praise. Now today, I think you can make the argument, even though our culture is very, very different uh, than this, uh, the city of Babel, in many ways it's not. Um, these are two sins that are still running rampant. You know, we follow dubious voices for a sense of security. Everybody wants to, everybody is a person of faith. You're either putting your faith in government or you're putting your faith in God. So everybody is making decisions based on wanting a sense of security. When, when God says, hey, I'm the only thing that's going to give you security. So it's kind of interesting to think that here the people are called out because they're looking for security in each other. When God says, no, I want you to find your security. I mean, that's a challenge for us. The second thing is that we do all sorts of things for attention. We do all, thing, all kinds of things to search for identity uh, to be seen by others as virtuous. And again, those things are played out in our culture each and every day. God's will for us is to find our security in him and not each other, not the familiar, but in a God who we gladly serve. And God's will is also us to find joy, contentment, meaning in life, knowing and praising him, not our accomplishments or others' opinions. So we can, even if we, even if we just stop there, we can learn a lot from the people in, in the Tower of Babel without even digging in deeper. But let's dig in deeper. There's a curious line in this passage. God says, nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So here's the question. Why would God want to limit our aspirations 
and abilities. He looks at these folks who are building this city and is building this tower, and, and he's like, nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Why does God want to limit their aspirations and their abilities? And maybe it's the same for us. Because God knows the immense potential human beings have that are creating his own image. We have an incredible amount of potential. And he has given us amazing liberty to exalt ourselves and design our own security systems without trusting him. But there are limits. Thousands of languages and thousands of different people limit the global aspirations of mankind for our own benefit. Having to deal with metric in English, having to deal with currency exchanges and language difference, it does encumber us. It does get in the way. Thousands of languages and thousands of different people Limit the global aspirations of mankind, but it's for our own benefit. Here's a passage in Luke 16, 26. I think it's a truth for us as individuals, but I think there's a global truth to it. Well, what good is it? What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Culture and society are really idle factories that are always propping up and making things for us to worship. So God in his wisdom has put some things in there to kind of temper our success, to make life a little bit more difficult. He has limited our global aspirations because it's good for us. And that's a challenging thought. That might be a new thought. Again, but if we're going to have this conversation, we need to remember things that we've talked about over the last couple of weeks. When God permits something, he does so for a reason. And that reason is part of a plan. God doesn't play defense. He has a plan in everything that he does and allows. God does not act whimsically, haphazardly, or aimlessly when he permitted a sin. He knew exactly what he was doing and his response and what his response would be. People, groups, and languages are not an afterthought, but they're a judgment designed to bring glory to God. So that's what we're going to spend the rest of this time talking about. How does the Tower of Babel, the division in the world, the things that hinder our global aspirations, the things that um, sometimes cause a spacecraft to burn up in the Martian atmosphere, how do those things all bring glory to God? And we're going to walk through four different ways real quick. And the first one is this. The division, the differences, the division in humanity and this is some pretty heady, weighty stuff, but I think it's actually pretty applicable for today. In the last few weeks, we haven't been afraid about getting deep, so hang on. The first thing is the division. The differences in humanity. It hinders the rise of a global, monolithic, anti-Christian state that could have the power to suppress and or wipe out the Christian faith. Think about it. Different languages, cultures, people groups, political states may hinder evangelization. There's no getting around it. But they also protect us from a centralized power in a world that is hostile to our faith. Here's a strange thought, but God is more concerned about the dangers of human uniformity than he is about human diversity. We are far too evil to be allowed to unite in one language or one government. I think we've seen that in the past, the power of centralized government, a centralized government that doesn't have its foundation in the biblical values is incredibly, incredibly destructive. The gospel spreads better and flourishes more because of the 6,500 languages, not in spite of them. So here's the question. In the future, isn't there going to be a great global government that persecutes Christians? And the answer is yes. God will one day, and maybe even now, starting to loosen the restraints that now holds back this evil. And I know what some of you are thinking, because I think the exact same thing. There's an objection that I think 
rises in, in all of us, most of us. And that's this question, really? This seems just too conspiratorial. It seems a little too paranoid. It seems a little bit more like a dystopian science fiction novel than reality. Will Christians suffer persecution at the hands of an oppressive government? And why, why, why? Well, we have some pretty strong hints. John 3.20 says this. Jesus said that the world likes or loves darkness but hates the light. John 15.19, Jesus said, well, the world hates you. Remember that it hated me first. And then 2 Corinthians 2.16. Again, this might be a foreign thought, but that passage in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 2, verse 16, says that Christians smell like death to the unsaved. So it might be hard for us to wrap our head around what um, one day will happen, who knows when. Uh, we can see even a little bit of a hint of it now. People hate the light. They embrace darkness, and, and Christians are, have always, and it may be a little bit more um, tangibly for us starting to feel the animosity towards people who embrace Christ. An antichrist will rise uh, with great global attraction, and there will be a great persecution, persecution of Christians. So here's the interesting thing. Here's the link between what's going to happen and, and what has already happened. In Babel. The Hebrew word for Babel occurs over 200 times in the Old Testament. You might not have known that. Almost always it's translated as Babylon. When Genesis 11 9 says, therefore its name was called Babel because there the Lord confused their language of the earth, it's a put down, it's an insult of the city of Babylon. It means Babylon, with its vaulted towers, high walls, gardens, idolatry, is pitiful compared to God. And this is where we have some eschatology coming. Some of you enjoy this, and others of you are a little bit more hesitant, but we need to fast forward. Babel, or Babylon, is also the name of the city of the beast, or God's enemy, in Revelation 14, 8 through 9. So, even though for a season Babylon is drunk with the blood of Christian martyrs, that's Revelation 17, 6, it will, just like the Tower of Babel, fall and bring God glory through its demise and destruction. Revelation 18, you great city, you mighty city, Babylon, for in a single hour, your judgment has come. Here's the point. God will one day loosen the restraint he has put on the nations and they will swell with the pride of Babylon. Christians will suffer. Then Christ will slay this man of lawlessness with his breath. Psalm 2 Thessalonians 2, 8. Genesis 11, 1 through 9, the passage we read this morning is a fat foreshadowing. It's just not, a, 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 um, it's not just telling a story of the past. It's, it's also a foreshadowing of the future. So as hard as it is, we need to recognize that the vision in humanity, while it does make some things harder, it also acts as a protection for us in the now. The second thing is, this division of people shows the authority and power. The authority and power of Jesus is magnified because he lays claim and rules over every language group and every people group. Matthew 28, 18 through 19, it says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus. The authority and power of Jesus is only magnified because it runs and rules over so many different groups of people. God has divided the languages and the nations in response to sin, but in the end, it magnifies his authority. It magnifies his power. His character is more glorious because he rules over so many different languages and people. 
Have you ever heard the expression, it was like herding cats? You know, dogs, dogs will be happy. They'll get together in a group. Have you ever tried to tell a cat what to do? Trying to tell multiple cats what to do? And it might seem like a silly example and even hesitate to bring it up. But Jesus is able to herd cats. He has authority over all things, over all people. And the more people that he has authority over, the more glory that he gets. This third one, this next one, I should say, the, the gospel is magnified because of the division of people, because uh, it in, the gospel is magnified because it impacts and transforms every language and every people group. Not only does every people group fall under God's authority and power, every people group is transformed and impacted by the gospel. Romans 1, 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel, the good news of Jesus is not provincial. It's not tribal. It changes every language and every people group. God is magnified because people from all corners of the world are transformed by him. The gospel is magnified because it impacts so many different kinds of people. Without diversity, the gospel would not shine as beautifully as it does in the prism of thousands of languages. Now, there has been a lot of conversation, even in our culture, about unity and what can unite us, and the things that are supposed to unite us divide us more than anything. The only thing that will ever unite us is the gospel. The only thing that will ever unite us as a people is the gospel. All right, so the Tower of Babel, the division of people, it hinders those who would want to hurt us, it gives examples to show God's authority and power. It glorifies and magnifies the gospel. And the last one is this. Our praise and worship is more beautiful because of its diversity. I want you to think about that. Our praise and our worship is more beautiful because it comes from such diversity. Revelations 5, 9 through 10. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals. You were slain and by your blood, you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they shall reign on the earth. Later on, Revelation 7, 9 through 10, I looked up and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation and all the tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. The sin on the plains of Shinar, as we mentioned the Tower of Babel, it may crash an occasional spacecraft, but it also gives us thousands of languages to praise God with. On a practical note, I'd encourage you, if you ever get the chance, uh, to come uh, to visit with Vita Life Church. We use the buildings on Sunday at 9, and they use the building at 11, and quite, of our people, quite a few of our people enjoy coming because they enjoy hearing singing in Spanish and they enjoy hearing God's word. Even though they might not know Spanish, it's, it's just neat to sing and to hear worship in a language that's not your own. So in the previous weeks, um, we've talked about the fact that God has a plan and that, knowingly, uh, and he, that he knowingly and preemptively folds all evil into his purposes. And, and we need to remember that as we watch the world unfold around us. Last week, we talked about how we all need to have a richer understanding of the grace that was exhibited at the cross as a result of sin, as a result of specifically the fall of Adam and Eve. 
We need to have a richer understanding of the obedience that Jesus walked in because he had intimacy with God. He spent time with them. He lived in the power and the direction of the Holy Spirit. And we need to have a richer understanding that the reign of Christ exists now over sin and that we have the ability to experience an abundant life. It was the last few weeks. But this week, I hope that we remember that Babel does four things. It, it protects us. And that's something we should have a deep appreciation for in times that um, can be a little bit unsettling. The Tower of Babel and the diversity, the results of it, it allows him to display his power and authority over all people. It allows him to um, magnify the gospel because it impacts and transforms so many people. And it also makes our praise and worship of him all the more magnificent. So there are some good things that come from, uh, from the people making a foolish decision that might not seem so foolish. It doesn't seem so bad to make a city. It doesn't seem so bad to make a tower. Um, we are guilty of, uh, our heart is probably guilty of much more than that uh, quite often but God uses it for his good. All right, well, thanks for joining us. Take care. God bless. Have a great week. Bye-bye.